Sundays on a sixpence, singing like a singer. A newbie and a newbie and a proud one, and that remember me. The bro- Good morning, everyone. Just want to make sure that uh, everybody's gotten a chance to check their tech. Make sure that your mics, you've muted your mics, and everyone should have access to their video. Um, thank you all for taking the time to join us. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to our host, and we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, I'll leave the poll for just a little bit longer. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kinshasa Taylor, CEO and founder of Cannabis excuse me, of Conovation Analytics. We are a cannabis consulting and vertical company. About three years ago, we started this journey just with um, recycling and upcycling bio-waste products. From there, we transitioned into doing more engagement with students and alumni at our respective HBCUs. Um, I pretty much just took my environmental justice background, mixed with my social justice background, as well as what I had done in emergency with what I come to. So I kind of describe myself as like a Allie Peach, born in California, nurtured in Georgia. And this work is very important to me. I saw that there was a need and there was a gap of social equity eligible folks that were going to miss out on an opportunity to be pushed through our pipeline, specifically this pipeline um, connected to the historically black colleges and connecting them to cannabis companies. So as a natural born leader, community activist, five-year commissioner for the city of Berkeley, an active and very long-term volunteer community member, board member, and also an operator of twin teenage girls, um, this was just a natural solution, a natural transition for solutions that were going to increase diversity in cannabis to ensure that African Americans are prepared as voters, obviously as students and potential professionals. And so I just want to welcome you all for coming today. We have some great guests. Today's show, entitled Social Equity in Cannabis, we'll be discussing things with awesome guests today. So I'll start off by introducing Mr. Al Harrington with Viola. Good morning, Al. Thank you. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. Okay, and then one of my favorite girls from the Shy Town, Michael Self. Hey, Michael, good morning. Thank you for showing up this morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yes, thank you. And next we have Latoya Rucker and Rebecca Collect with Collaxium. Did I pronounce that correctly, guys? It's Collexium. Collexium. But you were close. You were close. Kind of close, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us this morning for this conversation. And we also have Keith Mosley online. Keith will be helping me out. He'll start off this morning asking you all a couple of questions and um, we'll just kind of go from there. So first I would like to start off with all of you giving me a roadmap of how you got into the cannabis space. I gave you a little roadmap from environmental, upcycling, <laughs> bio-waste products, and I developed a bath product line and different syrups and different oils and then um, combine that with my STEM. And here I am connecting that also to my social justice work and now doing what I can to have an impact on social equity in cannabis. So Al, give us like a one minute roadmap of how you got from the NBA into the cannabis space. Yeah, so for me, it started back in 2011 um, when I was playing for the Denver Nuggets. So uh, my grandmother, who was 79 years old, came to see me play. Uh, you know, saw her, you know, taking all this medication. I asked her, why was she taking so much medication? And she pretty much had, I always say, like the black grandmama's issues, you know, saying she had high blood pressure, diabetes, glaucoma. And when she said glaucoma, I had read in the newspaper two days before how cannabis helped with glaucoma patients. And even at this time, I had only tried cannabis one time and I was so paranoid. I said, I would never try it again. But here I go telling her about what I read. And, uh, you know, the first, you know, and finally I kept calling it cannabis. And she asked me, well, what is cannabis? And I said, it's marijuana weed. She's like, reefer? She's like, boy, I ain't smoking no reefer. So she shut me down. So the next day uh, was when she was actually in pain. And she was just like, I said, you know, my eyes hurt so bad today. I'll try anything. So I called a friend of mine who I knew had a card. Uh, he went to the dispensary, got what they recommended for, um, for glaucoma. Uh, we bought it back. We vaporized it for, had to try it. I went and took an hour and a half nap. I woke up an hour and a half later, went to go check on her. 
And when I went downstairs, uh, she was that <clears throat> when I walked in the room, her back was to the door and uh, she was looking down. And I just said, Grandma, how you feeling? And she turned around and she was crying tears. She said, I'm healed. She said, you know, I haven't been able to read the words of my Bible in over three years. Wow. So ever since that moment, um, I've been on this crusade of, you know, trying to unlock all the magical powers of the cannabis plant. And, uh, you know, now here it is almost 10 years later. And, you know, now I'm a multi-state operator in four different states. It'll be seven states by the end of this year. And we're just continually to grow as a company. That's awesome. It's so interesting. We had a Kimbra on our show last week. And a lot of folks, even myself, I talked a little bit about my grandma. So it's like, it's interesting because while we were being impacted by the war on drugs, they were keeping us in the house. Now we're getting them marijuana. My, um, I was saying last week, my grandmother's 98. And she said, go get me one of those sticks. Because she said she has 100-year-old pain. She's 98. So it's like, you can't tell her no. You know? So it's like, thank you to all these grandmas for getting us into this space. You know, it's a, it's a great transition. So thank you for your story this morning, Al. Thank you. Yeah. And Latoya, let's switch over to you and Rebecca. How did you guys both find Collexium, correct? Yes. Yeah, so very interesting and similar to Al, my grandmother suffered from chronic pain. And I'm in Michigan, and so as we all know, Michigan is a legal, has been a legal state for a long time. So I went out and got my caregiver card and started learning about the plant and really became, um, just had a love for cannabis. So we created Collexium, and uh, we're moving forward with our project in Detroit. Yes, um, I have a different story. I worked with veterans in Maryland trying to lobby for them to get equal access to medication because my dad was a vet addicted to opioids and it seemed like the opioids were hurting him more than they were helping him. So, um, you know, we were looking at alternative ways to heal him and I just found out all the issues that vets have with having access to something like weed. Like they can go fight for their country, but they can't smoke a blunt. So it was kind of crazy to me. And then, you know, I looked in the legal cannabis space and saw how there were lacking of people of color being operators and entrepreneurs. And I'm like, this is not how cannabis looks. Cannabis is not full of all these white boys. It's, it's women in here, it's black people in here. So we formed Collexium last year and we're in the city of Detroit and we're really trying to kind of spear, spearhead diversity in cannabis, inclusion in cannabis. We want to show that black women are in cannabis. There were operators, there were owners, there were not only workers. So we're, we're really passionate about inclusion. That's cool. You know, um, my dad's a veteran also, and we're here in California. So it's like you have this federal, I guess, exactly. box. And so when I take my dad to the doctor, I'm like, hey, I'm giving him edibles. I make a pain cream with some of the products that I've upcycled. So it's like, I see that. Like when I go to the VA, they're like, they just tell me, yeah, you can give it to them, but they're not going to outright you know suggest that just because it's still federally illegal which we'll kind of go into today like i want to talk about that today like what would be the benefits if we go into federal legalization so yeah i appreciate you both latoya and rebecca and now i'm going to move over to michael self um michael works with cresco just from my experience these past three or four years probably one of the most diverse or african-american field cannabis major corporations that I've dealt with. So I just want to thank you, Michael and Barrington for uh, keeping it black and keeping it pushing. And I appreciate you. So tell us a little bit about how you got to Cresto. I know a little bit about your background, you know, in social justice, which led you there. So let everyone else. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. Very much appreciate that. It's great to hear everyone else's stories. Um, my story is probably a little bit different. Um, I have been in the cannabis space for about seven months now. I started working at Cresco Labs um, at the very end of October. So I'm still learning lots about the cannabis industry and you know how, um, you know, how cannabis works as a, as a corporation really um, working for Cresco Labs. But my background is in mental health. Um, I started my career as a, as a case manager and a therapist. And um, just not by accident, um, just by my education and interest and passion in social justice, I started working in the corrections field. Um, I started working here in Chicago uh, for the kids in juvenile detention. And my work was really focused on the most vulnerable populations that are incarcerated, which are girls and women, 
um, the LGBT population. And as federal laws were changing uh, about conditions of confinement, I just found myself in the right place at the right time doing advocacy and training and coaching for how the system needs to change to meet people's needs. And so I consider myself doing human rights work in the justice system. Um, and from there, I became a national consultant in corrections and uh, went around the country to the nation's prisons, jails, and juvenile facilities talking about things like sexual safety, um, about how to set up facilities uh, to meet the needs of girls and women because they're often incarcerated for much different reasons, um, many different reasons in boys and men. Um, and so I just became more and more interested about social justice in general. Um, and so through, through those experiences, um, you know, I feel like I go to different industries and work on the social justice issues within that industry. And with respect to cannabis, um, adult use was coming here in Illinois. I wanted to find out, you know, I can qualify as a social equity applicant. How do I get in this space? And I realized really quickly um, that it is really, really difficult to get into the cannabis space. <laughs> um, and so I, I took what my expertise and passion is and applied that to the cannabis industry. So um, I work on social justice at Cresco Labs. And so that's, that's how I'm here. Yeah. And we'll get a little bit, you know, a little bit later, we'll get into some of those tenets that attracted me to Cresco. And I felt like there was synergy between the work that we were doing and the tenets that you all had set out. And I know, you know, there's like a varying opinions about the efficacy of some of the larger social equity or larger cannabis companies and their social equity initiatives. But yep. so you all know. Um, can Chasa, I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if anyone else is, but you're real low. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but you're pretty low. Oh, I don't know how to get louder. Can you, got, Tiffany, can you hear me? She can't hear. I, no, I can't. I can hear you, but, and it may be, um, let me ask something. Michael, can you hear me more clearly than you hear Chasa? Yes. You can? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Can it, am I loud enough? Should I speak louder? Does that help if I speak louder? Louder? Kind of? Okay. So maybe this means Keith needs to talk and not me. But um, I was just saying, like, part of uh, my goal was to connect the grassroots to folks in the middle, to connect them to the cannabis space, because I feel like together, there are things that um, we can accomplish. When um, I started looking at social equity, and this is a question I wanna to pose to all of you all, what does social equity look like for you? In the case of our HBCU initiative, um, and being in, I'm in Berkeley, California, I saw uh, social equity folks being um, taken advantage of with the social equity program, specifically in Oakland. Um, Los Angeles has just been, um, excuse my language, a clusterfuck because they've had so many people apply um, we applied, um, my partner and I, because he's from also from Los Angeles, and I just saw that it was different. So for me, I define social equity for historically black college students as a, a tool to provide privilege. 73% of students that attend historically black colleges and universities, you guys are HBCU grads, um, receive Pell Grants. And so when we were thinking about, you know, what does social equity look like for these folks? We said, okay, they're going to school. So they're obviously going to be looking for careers and they're going to be looking for professions. So we can focus on what I call respectfully like the lower level where we're focusing on expunging people, getting them, um, your, their records cleared, things like that. As a, and then we have, I guess you could say on the top level, um, folks that may be um, being incubated of some sort that as you all probably know, our incubation programs are pretty crappy. So Al, how do you define social equity eligibility or social equity eligible folks? What does that look like to you? Um, so social, so it's same thing for me, like, so I'm, I'm in LA, right? So I've been um, helping out some social equity people here. And uh, to your point, like it has been a disaster, right? And when I look at social equity, um, I look at almost like a form of reparations, right? This is supposed to be an opportunity that's supposed to uh, give us, give people from our community and people of color, an opportunity to excel in an industry that was, you know, pretty much used to destroy our communities, right? And, you know, what sucks about it is that being that it's still federally illegal, you know what I'm saying? You you know, the only way that you can get funding is through either private corporations or private investors, right? 
And what that leaves us open to, and I mean us meaning black people or people of color, is predatory investors, which you just touched on, right? Because at the end of the day, like it's it's just it's extremely tough to get access to capital. And you know, with these people that are, you know, giving us this money, they're seasoned vets, right? They're 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 pros at taking people companies from them and different things like that. So, you know, and and then also you take it like almost a, a, another uh, another step when you think about you know a lot of the social equity applicants what they're looking for they're looking for people that come from these neighborhoods right that a lot of times you know have never made more than forty thousand dollars a year uh, salary right or people like that were in that were locked up so now you're asking people that institutionalized you're asking us as investors to invest in people who have no business you know real savvy. And it's just, like I said, institutionalized or all the other, you know, things that come with it. It's just really tough to make an investment into those people, right? So I think that, you know, what we need to do moving forward is, you know, some of these bigger corporations that, you know, want to do the right thing and help. That's where the education comes in, right? Because we need to educate um, these young entrepreneurs, uh, people of color that are coming into the space on how to actually survive in this industry because that's what it's all about right now. It's all about survival. And the way that these programs are set up right now, you know, we're not gonna survive because the, regu the regulatory uh, uh, things are just way too difficult. Um, like I said, being able to get access to, you know, the right kind of capital is just not available. So it really makes it, makes it tough for social equity to be successful in my eyes. Right, and, and like for me, specifically with historically black colleges, it's where our black upper and upper middle class is produced. So when I started thinking about working with black college students, I'm like, there's enough of us to be FUBU. We can help ourselves. We can help one another. You know, there's enough of us. If we wanted to only focus on or create an environment similar to HBCUs and our companies, that would be a natural transition for folks coming from historically black colleges and universities. So, you know, I. I I get that um, and that disconnect, like you were saying. Um, one of the things that I liked about Cresco's program, and I'm gonna switch over to get your kind of tidbit, uh, Michael, I, is that you all have like a holistic solution, meaning you focus on expungement, you guys focus on engagement, you focus on educational development. We've worked with you on engagement, we've worked with you on educational development. So what would you say makes Cresco's program seed a lot different from other programs, because SEED is starting to kind of be a common thing with other cannabis companies, but I'm assuming the acronym, Social Equity, you know, ED. So what, how would you say that Cresco is combating or contributing to the overall impact that we like to have on social equity in Canada? Well, um, <laughs> it's tough. Um, I, I didn't, I don't think I, as, as I said, I'm new to cannabis, so I don't think I really understood how tough uh, the cannabis industry is um, and, and will continue to be, I guess, for the foreseeable future. Um, I think in general, social equity to me is, is the entitlement to access. You know, um, um, you know, we all should be able to access the cannabis industry or our education system or schools, you know, or, you know, higher education, whatever it is that, you know, the things that will propel us in life, we are entitled to access to that. And so I think going with our, the social equity program at Cresco, it's really from a perspective of, um, you know, when you know better, you do better, uh, simply. Um, you know, Cresco is a white male cis owned cannabis company, big, you know, uh, successful cannabis company. Um, and so I think, um, my leadership has expressed, um, you know, that they have a responsibility, you know, to um, address these issues and not hide from it. And, um, you know, ask me, you know, to figure out what is our, what is the best, best pathway forward. And so um, the way we approach social equity and educational development, you know, that's the acronym for SEED is, um, as you said, you know, we have a pillar, a pillar that focuses on restorative justice programming. We have a community business incubator in which we focus on entrepreneurs and those that want to apply to have a plant touching uh, business. And then we also focus on um, education and workforce development. And we're working with schools to write or expand cannabis curricula 
um, was exploring the idea of having a residency program, kind of like a, um, a paid apprenticeship program at Cresco. Um, and so we're, we're always open to and exploring new opportunities to give people access to the industry um, or access to their own agency. Because if we're sponsoring an expungement uh, event or we're volunteering or participating in some way, we don't want to force people to go into the cannabis industry just to have our help. I think that's a big thing about um, the approach to social equity at, Can uh, at Cresco is really about what is it that you need as a community, as an individual, you know, um, as an organization, as opposed to we're, you know, we're a big cannabis company and we have an obligation to, um, you know, support and provide access. So we're going to tell you what we want to support. We go into the communities and build relationships with organizations and individuals um, and ask that question, you know, how can we be of service to you as opposed to perpetuating like the non nonprofit industrial complex. Right. Okay, cool. So Latoya and Rebecca, um, my good friends from Flint, I have a cousin that lives there. He was doing some work with the Lieutenant Governor and um, we know Detroit, Michigan in general has had a lot of social justice issues. And so kind of give me a little um, breakdown of what social equity looks like in Detroit, because it's interesting with our work in the South, um, Keith and I wrote legislation for two years in Georgia. We can't even mention social equity. We can't mention the war on drugs. We can't take that conversation to the Bible Belt, you know? So it's like, we have to have a different strategy. So what are the, what does social equity look like up in Detroit? And um, what are the barriers that you all have seen specifically in Detroit? I would say here in California, it's more like I was saying, it's a, a financial thing. I can't, I'm working on my vertical license. I have my um, cannabis festival license. And so I'm working on uh, manufacturing vertical license. My biggest issue is real estate poverty. I have to be able to spend $180,000 just on rent, just to begin <laughs> to, um, to apply. But then I also have privilege. I've worked politically since I'm 43. I've worked politically since I was 19. So I know how to get in there and have those conversations and make sure that before I get to the next Step. this one is solid so what do those steps look like what do those barriers look like and what does social equity look like in Detroit so right now we have a moratorium uh, as far as on the rec and so social equity is directly connected to the recreational license uh, so initially when we started on this journey we applied for a medical license and so that's been our focus and so for medical there is no social equity program but just because we know that the industry is gearing towards rec, we did apply for the social equity program. And so since I have been a caregiver since 2009 and also lived in the city of Detroit, I got a 35% off discount on, on the license once I can apply for it. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off Latoya's point, so in the city of Detroit, there's a moratorium on recreational sales. One of the reasons is because the recreational ordinance right now has no legislation written in there about people of color, about social equity, about legacy Detroiters. So I lead this group of industry leaders that are local to the Metro Detroit area, and we're trying to influence some policy so that at least 25% of the recreational licenses go to a legacy Detroiter. And those um, stipulations are still being determined right now what, what you have to have to be considered a legacy Detroiter. Um, so that's interesting. But on the social equity program that Michigan has right now that only really applies to cities outside of Detroit, um, excuse my French, but it's bullshit. All it really is, is a coupon code. You get 25% off for having this zip code, 25% off for doing this, but then what? You still don't have access to the real estate, which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars if it is in the green zone. We were able to acquire our property, but we're the unicorns. You know, people that look like us often don't have the story that we have about real estate. And then you have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire attorneys, consultants, architects, how are you gonna get access to these people? Hourly rates in the cannabis industry are already astronomical for an attorney, for a consultant. So you have to have access to these people to even complete the application. 
the Michigan program has no nothing about that. And then, you know, the capital startup costs, we're in cultivation and processing. The capital startup costs, we're right now raising $2 million. Where are we going to find $2 million? Where are we going to, you know, like our network of being Detroiters, we are educated. You know, we went to some of the best HBCUs. Fam, you, what up, though? Um, we went... <laughs> we. We went to some of the best schools, but still, you know, we can't call our dad's brother and say, hey, can you loan me $2 million? So there you go with that systematic, you know, racism too. So right now, you know, um, we have a coalition that's working with the state of Michigan to improve the social equity program. We want to include um, options and resources after you get into the social equity program, now what? You need access to consultants, to attorneys, to architects at a better price or maybe even pro bono. You need access to real estate. So we're working with the city on that, on the rezoning of the ordinance, and you need access to capital for that build out of that facility. So we're also working on an incubation program so we can have some of these uh, very large cannabis companies, you know, donate to this incubator pro. They have millions of dollars and we are requiring nothing from them. We are requiring nothing from them from coming in the city of Detroit that has seen so much blight and turmoil over the year. We're requiring nothing from these million billion dollar cannabis companies. But now it's time to say, hey, you want to come sell weed in our hood? You need to have a percentage of your, you know, revenue go to social equity applicants. So legacy Detroiters can have the same, you know, access that you have. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. When you were talking about like how social equity looks there, it looks so different here. I know in Illinois, it looks different as well. So it's interesting that you said that they have recreational and they have um, medicinal social equity right. applications. So no. there is no social equity for, for medical. Me, for medical. It's only for recreation. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess since we're here, it's just whatever, you know, most people are selling recreational. Like, I think our cards just expired. So we don't even have medical cards anymore. Oh, there right. are no use in California because we have the recreational. So it's interesting to see the different barriers that are placed that keep us out of it. I think one of my goals is to, like you were saying, where are those people with that $2 million? We're trying to get them in that HBCU pipeline. Where are those attorneys? Our goal is to make sure that they have the skills, they go through our sessions, go through our programming, so they can work for you because that's something that we don't have. Like you said, we don't have access to some of those um, finances. We don't have access to some of those professionals that can help us expedite, you know, and actually include more people in this um, industry. So it's, it's interesting you know, and I, and I want to ask you all, like, uh, if you were to create a universal, I guess you could say, equity system, um, what would that look like? Like, so for example, I'm here in Berkeley, we have no equity program. Um, most people don't realize Berkeley is a very racist city. People, you know, you see the Birkenstocks and the hippies and stuff like that. But our city is very, very um, racist. We have what I call in California called casual racism, which is a lot scarier then what you see in the South when someone is outright, you know, kind of racist in your face, it's, uh, it's scarier. So I think that that has contributed to um, the integrity of some of the folks that have been incubating. I've had a client that I had to drop just because, you know, he's like, oh, I'm going to take 30% for making your labels, 20%. It's like, no, you're going to own their whole company. I'm going to charge you for your rent. And so when you look at universal, if we were to create a universal social equity system. What does that look like to you, Al? What does that include? Well, it's funny, like, I'm just listening to the lady speak. And, you know, obviously, I'm, uh, you know, I have a business in Detroit. And to their point, like, it was, it was even difficult for me, someone that had resources, right? You know, even my business was raided uh, two years ago there, you know what I'm saying? And it cost us probably anywhere between 15 and $20 million in opportunity loss, you know, in a city where, you know, it's it's black, you know, we were trying to bring, you know, uh, black opportunity, black jobs, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, you know, we have an incubation program, same thing, all these different things that we wanted to do in this community. And, you know, they don't even hold their police and, you know, uh, accountable for anything, 
at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? We were illegally raided. And if it wasn't, if I didn't have the resources that I would have had, you know, who knows? You know, I had to hire seven attorneys, right? <laughs> to get us out of that, you know what I mean? So they took to their point, like the hourly, what it costs for all this stuff. But to answer your question, to get back to like social equity, you know, what I think that what this, these cities and these states need to do is they need to either, they need to decide either the social equity funding needs to either come out of the tax money or need to come out of the licensing money. One or the other, you know what I'm saying? Because you have all these companies because, you know, for us to sit here and think that these companies are gonna give us, give social equity money uh, to, to give money to social equity companies is just, we're, it'll never happen. They'll say it, they'll say whatever they gotta say to get their licenses and get wherever they're trying to get to. Yeah, we'll support this, we'll do that, we'll do this. And we know because we've seen a lot of these states where limited license have been given out and they've been supposed to give money back to social equity, they haven't given it back. And what have they blamed it on? They're saying losses. We don't make any money, we don't make any money. But when you look at their p &L, it looked like they're making money, you know what I'm saying? So. Um, you know, I think that it's going to come from legislation. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to come from the business owners because it's just too hard. It's very difficult in this, in this space. You know, I always say like, you know, even a company like mine, like on the surface, we seem very, very successful, which we are. Right. But when it comes down to the cash flow and different things like that, because of 280E, because of the tax laws and all these different things that we have to deal with within the industry, it's really difficult to make money in the legal cannabis landscape for yeah. right now. You know, so, you know, like New York is one of the places where I like, because like New York, so they had 10, they gave out 10 licenses, right? And they said they addressed diversity and their way of addressing diversity was giving three white women uh, one of the licenses, right? So they covered 10%. And then when you, and then when you, and then when you, uh, you know, peel back the onion, you see that two of these women, husbands are billionaires, right? Yeah. So what were these ladies? These ladies were front figures, right? The same way they use black people for these social equity licenses here in LA. Right. Yeah. But what they're proposing is because those 10 companies will be the only companies that will be vertically integrated in, in the state of New York, that each one of them, they're going to charge them a one time fee of $15 million. So if they do that, that's $150 million that now they're supposed to take that money and they're supposed to use it for education and for social equity, you know. So that kind of idea I actually like, because now we're talking about significant capital that I think that we can now spread around you know what I'm saying, to social equity applicants, because right now, like, it's a joke when I hear, like, they're gonna give you 30 grand. Like, 30 grand only get you through that. that that's not enough for the application. You know what no. I mean? It's like, it doesn't cover one attorney bill. It doesn't, to your point, it doesn't cover rent. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, even here in LA with social equity, I've been holding a building now 13 months. I've been holding four buildings for 13 months, and I'm paying rent every single month, waiting on a program that seems like it might never happen. So when you think about it, like who has access to that? Who can do that? You know what I'm saying? So I just firmly believe that, you know, even these, even these landlords and different things like, and I understand this business, right? So I get it. But I think that, you know, we have to come up with a universal way to address these issues where maybe, you know, we allow the landlords to participate a little bit on the equity side of the business where they can, you know, circumvent the rent for a while until you get through the process. But we have to be very creative, you know, but I will say that, you know, if we're going to think that these MSOs are going to be the answer to our prayers, it'll never happen. I think it's definitely going to happen at the legislation level. And I think that it's going to be us obviously having these conversations and pushing the narrative. And last thing I'll touch on, if you think about, you were just saying that 25% needs to go to legacy Detroit people. It should be a hundred percent. Like you should not be able to come into Detroit unless you have a, 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 a person on your application Yep. That's from Detroit, period. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, why is that so hard? That's not a bad business decision. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to, if you want to do right by the people that was mostly affected by the war on drugs, you have to force them in and allow them to be included. Yeah. Well, I know, like, with our state specifically in California, we do have that fund that comes every year. So there's about forty, fifty million dollars that goes into that. But the way that the legislation is set up. It never trickles to us because it goes a city or a county has to apply for it and unless you're in partnership with a city council member or a county supervisor it's not going to trickle over to you and so right. like um one of the federal pieces of legislation that i think can benefit african americans is the major act um by my congresswoman barbara lee and so um initially we all, you guys were all, well, some of you all were invited because we normally go to 12 different black colleges 
and we do our engagements in person. Corona messed things up, so we just kind of shifted things to this transition. So one of the events we had particip wanted to participate in was the Congressional Black Caucus. So again, when I develop solutions, I try to have things that are holistic. My goal there was to ensure that Black colleges were included in MAJOR Act. You know, MAJOR also would have dealt with that federal scheduling. It also dealt with, um, or deals with, excuse me, it deals with funding going back into those communities. Um, again, to kind of go back to my roots in this, social justice and STEM. I have a very good STEM partner. Um, he does K through 12. So how can I get cannabis money to get to him? Because he needs to produce those K through 12s that make it to our black colleges that eventually will make it to the industry. And so I know one of the complaints I get a lot from grassroots folks here, specifically in the Bay Area, I get a little more than complaints, a little craziness sometimes, but um, they're saying the money never trickles down to what they're, what they're doing. It doesn't trickle down to the community. It doesn't trickle down to that person that needs the expungement. But it's like, you know, how do we, like you were saying with legislation, that can help. But then again, what else can we do, um, Latoya and Rebecca, to ensure that our programs, that will, to not ensure, to increase the efficacy of the work that we're doing? Because I know here in Berkeley, I have no hope. Oakland is jacked up again. LA is, is kind of jacked up. So it almost seems like we have to kind of create our own group and try to create a fund so we can start funding these things and these people, you know, in a manner that we understand from our experiences will be beneficial for them to get into this space. Yeah, so we just had to really uh, reach out to our local politician. So James Tate, he leads the initiative here for social equity uh, within the city of Detroit. We got his support uh, for our special land use hearing in order to be able to grow and process at our location. Uh, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of groundwork of just getting in front of people, attending meetings, having the your ear to what's going on in the industry so that you can be a part of those conversations and influence the narrative. Yeah, and to your point, we've just really taken matters into our own hands. It's like, y'all not going to do it? All right, I'm going to do it because it has to be done. So we formed a group of people of color who are in the industry that can influence policy. That's what we're doing now, you know, in the recreational ordinance for Detroit. In that policy, we're saying that these million dollar multi-state brands are going to have to have a percentage of their revenue go to social equity applicants like it's in the policy so you know to al's point earlier a lot of these companies say they're going to give money you know to the community or to social equity and they never do it because they're not held accountable so we're trying to you know write some accountability into the ordinance to say hey if you don't give you know, a percentage of your revenue to social equity applicants, here's a fine, you know, or you're in jeopardy of losing your license. Like this, they, there has to be some type of repercussions, you know, because in the past, there's this been slap on the wrist. In our neighborhood where our facility is, we canvassed the neighborhood. Latoya and I are from the west side of Detroit. So this is our neighborhood. And, you know, we go to these neighborhood block meetings. We go to these community centers and we hear from residents that these cannabis companies, these dispensaries that have been here, they have done nothing for the community, yeah. you know, and they're all owned by Chaldeans, you know? <laughs> so when we're going around in the neighborhood, they don't even think we're the owners. We think, they think we're the black faces that are representing the Chaldeans and the white and the white people that are in the cannabis industry. So that's something we also have to lobby to our own people that look like us, like, hey, no, we, we are really the owners. We really own the license. We really own the building. Yeah. You know, that's something else. But we're also taking matters into our own hand as part of our non, we have a nonprofit arm of Collexium where we're creating a workforce development program where we're training people that look like us how to grow, how to process, about 280E, about how to find a cannabis attorney. So we're doing it on our own, you know, yeah. and we're um, canvassing what other people of color in the cannabis industry to support us. And so, you know, we, we've been in the industry for some time. And so we know some pretty amazing you know, black entrepreneurs in cannabis and we're just gonna do it on our own because yeah. we can't really wait for the government because, you know, if we wait, it'll be too late. We know how cannabis is, you know, you gotta have that market share or you'll end up like Colorado with a billion dispensaries and how do you really get market share? You gotta get in in the beginning, you know? 
Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we talked about that a little bit last week. Um, well, not last week. Um, Mary Pryor was on our first show. And so we had talked before and on the show, she was just saying like, if Trump is in office, things are going to get really bad for cannabis. Um, and I'm like, you know, possible. But I think that um, one of the things, again, that we're trying to do is to kind of make sure there's a bridge. So Michael, I know on our one of our shows, we had some folks just talking about like, you know, just keeping it real, like cannabis companies are doing this, they're not doing that. What do you think makes Cresco stand out from some of the other companies like a, you know, you said, what do I think makes Cresco stand out? Stand out Because I know that, you know, remember we had folks just saying, hey, we don't see Cresco doing this. We don't see this company doing that. We see, um, I think we had someone that also said we have celebrities. I guess they were referencing like Jay-Z, where he works with Kaliva, you know, but they said, is he really an owner? You know, what kind of ownership right. does he have? So like what, as a, a corporation, excuse me, as a corporation in this dialogue, what could you what do you have to say or what can you show that Cresco has done to kind of combat some of those yeah. issues? I think in general, just my everyone on the panel is absolutely right. Um, you know, uh I agree with everything that people have been saying. I think what is maybe one of the things that is different uh about Cresco is that Cresco is headquartered in Chicago and the you know the illinois social equity provisions um although there, there's still tons that need to be done the illinois social equity provisions require um cannabis businesses to put uh put their revenue into a fund in which social equity applicants can apply for grants from um they require um you know the cannabis companies to either hold an incubator or provide some money into that fund. Um, and so at Cresco, we're doing both. Um, some of the comments that you know, we've already talked about is it, des it definitely has to be tied to legislation. It has to be tied, you know, people have to be held accountable, including Cresco. Um, and so I think where Cresco is, is Cresco is going above and beyond what is required in the Illinois state law with respect to you know, putting money into the social equity fund or hosting the incubator. Um, what we do is um, we provide those, the, the, the wraparound services, if you will, um, that are seriously needed. I think one of the things I started by saying my story is I was interested in the cannabis industry. I went to a community meeting and realized that even though I'm a social equity applicant, I don't have the expertise, the resources, the time, you know, to, to, even make an attempt to get involved into the cannabis industry in the state of Illinois. And I think that most of us don't understand that. Um, what the women from Collexium were saying is like, they're out there, they're talking to their politicians, they're in people's faces, they're holding people accountable. But most folks don't understand that that's what needs to be done. Like, you know, adult use went passed in Illinois last May or June and it, you know, went into effect in January. Our community, we needed to be focusing and getting ready for that and educating ourselves and writing business plans and all of that. We need to be doing that in 2011, you know, to be prepared for today. Because now that applications are now coming out and, you know, Cresco is, you know, I, I work in social equity. That's my full-time job. But our legal team is helping our incubatees write their applications and, you know, give them information. This is how Cresco writes our applications. This is how we set up our retail you know, here's the information you need to know about banking and how difficult that is, et cetera, et cetera. That's still, you're in the point in which you're writing your application. And if you get a license, then you have six months to go from license to operations in the state of Illinois. You know, and it's like, okay, as was said, where I'm going to get the, you know, where am I going to get the tens of millions of dollars I need to go from my license to my, to operating, to opening up my doors? And so I think most folks don't really understand just how difficult that is. So yes, you can hold cannabis companies accountable by making sure that they're giving money and giving money back to social equity applicants. But we also have to have that education for our folks to understand what it is that they don't know, um, that they need to know. So th I mean, those are, that's what access means to me. You can't just say, well, here's an application this is your access. Absolutely not. You know, um, 
you need to be able to have somebody, you need to network, you need access to capital, you need all of those different things to be successful. And then you need to know how to maintain your operations. One fine can, you know, take a small business, take a, a small cannabis owner out of business. So, and if you don't have your lawyers, your compliance people, your security, your IT, all of that tight, then, you know, all of that was for naught. Even if you do have the money, even if you do get, um, you know, get the access to information and knowledge and all that, there are so many things that need to happen to be able to have a successful, legitimate cannabis business. It feels almost um, impossible, you know, just as a citizen, just as somebody who would be interested in getting a license, it feels like, oh my God, how, how could I even do that? So I think what we're doing at Cresco is trying to set realistic expectations. Here's what you need to know. Here is the type of money that you need to come forth with. Here's what we're able to do. Are you able to um, provide the time and the energy and you know, educate yourself um, to get to the point where you want to be? Um, I think those are, that's a big thing is being able to set those realistic expectations because I think that for some of us, we see the opportunity to get involved in the cannabis industry and it's like, okay, you know, I won the lotto. Well, no, this is really difficult, you know, and this is, this is the road that's ahead of you. And we have to be, we have, we are obligated to support you through this process, because if we don't, then we're going to just keep getting what we're getting, okay. which is a white industry. I would say like for myself, and then Keith's going to come on and start and ask you guys a couple of questions. The best advice I can give people is like, don't give up, like, I applied for my cannabis festival license because it was $1,000, another four, and you didn't need anything. But there was no law in the city of Berkeley. I've been a commissioner for the past five years, cool with my council members. We own a couple of houses in Berkeley, so I'm in two different districts. And my friend who was black, and had, I had wrote the legislation so that it could pass so that I could use the license. It didn't happen, got into this crazy thing, but it's like a year later, now I'll have the piece of legislation up in December. So I was like, I, I wanted to give up because I was like so upset, like what's going on? You know, yet the issue I had was that there's no smoking at the parks. And so I needed to change the law like San Francisco that allowed smoking for nine hours in the park so that I didn't have to have issues. But I was up against white women um, and crazy old white women in Berkeley that just come to council meetings, you know, every week to just kind of create issues. And so, Luckily, you know, I didn't give up and this December we'll have some legislation that passes. So just to kind of give my tidbit, I would say don't give up if you're in this space. Keep pushing. Something's going to happen. I've been doing this for three years. I've, every year something better happens. I just got someone that called me who's black, a black college graduate and offered me a million dollars to help me with my business. So it's like, you know, the one thing that I've realized is that you can't give up. You got to keep pushing. So thank you. And I'm going to switch over to Keith right now. Thank you, Keith. So my next, my question is for um, both uh, Michael and Al. Uh, with you all having incubation uh, programs, what, uh, what would be the requirements that you would have of individuals that are interested in participating. I know, um, you know, a big challenge that you all are probably running into is people will say, hey, you know, you have this incubation program, I'm interested in cannabis, but then you start talking to them and you see they don't, they don't even have a business plan together or they, they aren't very familiar with the uh, industry. So in order for them to, um, you know, even be qualified to uh, have a potential to participate and be successful in your program, what kind of check, what needs to be on their checklist when they come speak with you all to be a participant. And uh, we can start off with you, Al, and then go to Michael. Yeah, for me, it's just, uh, you know, I'm in the business of building brands, right? So obviously I have assets that I can bring to the table that we could, um, you know, elevate, you know, other cannabis brands for people of color, right? So for me, like the first step is just actually having a business, right? Um, you know, for me, it's been a little bit more difficult to like start people from scratch, right? Just because, it, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to that and right. it's a startup, right? But, you know, for me, I've been focusing more on, you know, people that are actually already in the space and just need 
access to more resources to be able to elevate their businesses. So that's how we're starting, you know, with most of our incubator program um, initiatives out the gate. Okay. And uh, Michael? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think to qualify for our incubator program, um, and I will say again that so far it has only been implemented in Illinois. Um, but the first thing is you need to have, um, you need to qualify as a social equity applicant. Um, if you can't um, qualify based on the state guidelines as a social equity applicant, then you are ineligible for our incubator program. Um, and that will vary from state to state. Um, the other thing is, is, is exactly that, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to be incorporated as a business, but, you know, in reading many of our incubator, it, reading many of our applications into our incubator program, it's really clear the people who have thought this through, who, um, you know, understand what, what needs to go into a business plan, have thought about this very seriously, have done their homework, versus people who think it's a great, like me, people who think it's a great idea, but have no idea how to get started, you know, but just want to get involved in the industry. Um, and I, yeah, I think those are, to me, those are the biggest different, differentiators to um, gain access into our incubator program. I have people, have people stop me at my daughter's dance class, people hit me up on Facebook um, and Instagram saying that they want to be involved, but they'll say stuff like, um, <clears throat> you know, I want to, I want to make baked goods and I want to infuse cannabis into my baked goods. Okay. Um, what baked goods do you want to make? Brownies, cookies, cakes? Like what is, you know, what is your niche? Do you know anything about, you know, extracting oil from a plant, you know, um, dosaging, all of those things are big deals in the regulated cannabis industry. And so I want to make baked goods is not going to get it. You know, you need to really you know, um, think it through and be as specific as possible on what you would like to accomplish. Um, some of the invite, when, when someone asked me that question, you know, this was somebody I know, and this was, this was pre-COVID, but it was like, you need to get out to California and Washington and, you know, Colorado to understand the industry and see what's possible, you know, and learn about infusing cannabis oil into food, you know, um, just because you can make a good cookie doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're ready to enter the cannabis industry. And again, that doesn't mean that you're disqualified from our incubator, but if we're getting a couple hundred applicants, it's going to be, you know, clear who's ready and thought this through and has done their homework and who has not. Yeah. And also I'll just touch on one thing too, is like, uh, you know, those entrepreneurs that, you know, to her point, like don't know really too much about anything. Um, there are some um, cannabis, I would say universities out there. There's a black owned one called the Cleveland School of Cannabis, which I'm looking to do a partnership with so that we can start creating these, uh, these curriculums, you know, that we could teach people over like an eight to 10 week period, you know, a, enough of a foundation about the industry so that now they can really start to form and, you know, create a business plan and try to figure out exactly what they want to do. So I think that, you know, to the point of this panel, it all just always comes back to education. You know what I'm saying? As much as we can educate our people about the opportunities and just about the industry overall, I think the more success that we can have and the more that we can start to figure out, you know, who are the, you know, rock stars out there, you know, that can, you know, jump in this industry and make a difference. That's good stuff, good stuff. So the, the next question I have is for uh, Rebecca and, and LaToya. Um, you know, I've had an opportunity. I personally know Rebecca, um, you know, fam graduate, boot camp participant. Um, you know, I've had an opportunity to watch her, you know, grow the business and, uh, you know, really do her thing and hustle. Uh, so for you, Rebecca and LaToya, what, um, what are your recommendations on how people become, can become knowledgeable? Because, I mean, you all are you know, prime examples of just ordinary people you know, who weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth, don't have access to capital, but yet and still you all are out here making it happen. Yeah, um, I think one of the things is um, to Michael's point, it was, you know, cannabis, people of color come to us all the time like, oh, we want to get into cannabis. I'm like, okay, what you want to do? Open a dispensary. I'm like, okay number one issue right here is you didn't even do your research. You didn't even, you know, if you're an attorney, how can you transfer your 
law knowledge, your law skill into cannabis. So it's really to uh, for us, it's been educating people on how they can use their skills to apply to the cannabis industry. And then one of the other things is, you know, we're developing programming right now to Al's point earlier about developing a curriculum. We're developing a curriculum because we're operators. We're from the city. We're regular people, you know, <laughs> um, and we are teaching people, okay, if you want to be in cannabis, this is how it really looks. This is how the, how long these hearings really take this is how this business plan really has to be these financial models really have to be from an operating standpoint we've seen consultants across our path that have tried to consult you know in cannabis and they don't even have no cannabis industry experience so you are trying to tell me how to write a business plan and a financial model and you don't have any cannabis experience so we're trying to fill that gap as operators and regular everyday people we're trying to educate the community around us. Okay, if you want to be a grower, this is how it looks. If you want to have a micro business, this is how this looks. This is how the application looks. This is how our hearing, this is how our hearing was for us. Another thing we've tried to do is utilize social media, especially now during COVID, everybody's at home on their phone. So we've been trying to utilize our Instagram and put out a lot of informational educational videos. Hey guys, we just came back our, from our hearing. This is what happened. This is what's the point of our hearing. Hey guys, we just got our site plan approved. This is what happened. This is what comes next. So we're educating people along our journey so they can see like hands on. Cause a lot of times you have these big cannabis companies like the Mad Men and the Candescents and you don't even know how they even got there in the first place. So we're trying to educate people along our journey and then I guess you could talk about caregivers and stuff like that, how you found out about it. Yeah, just, I think you can't take no for an answer. Yeah. That's what I would tell people because I started in 2009 when it was very gray. Uh, it was a lot of uncertainty and being a female, it was, it was difficult. Um, but I just decided not to take no for an answer. And I think sometimes if, in cannabis, if you're good at what you do, your product will speak for itself. You know, you just have to assemble the right type of people around you in order to make those things happen. You can't think that you can do it all by yourself. Yeah. You know, I learned very quickly that you can't, it's, it's too complex, it's too diverse. Uh, it's so many different moving parts, like Al said, and so many different players that are in this game. And so you really have to smarten up, you have to educate yourself. You know, you don't wanna move too fast because yeah, you can come in and, and some investor will end up taking your whole business from you. You know, we've had situations where we've been introduced to people and at the end of the day, we had to walk away from it because it just didn't work for what we're trying to do. They was trying to play us like we don't know how valuations work, you know, <laughs> exactly. but they can't play, they can't play two sisters from Detroit, okay? Yeah. Um, it don't stop. I'm going to tell you something. It's crazy. It don't stop because I've been in the business for oh. 10 years and you still try to play me. <laughs> Yeah, so don't worry about it. Is, edu is educating <laughs> yourself and and you know putting the tools in your tool belt that can assist you. You know, knowing that business acumen, knowing how valuations work, knowing how license licenses work and operating agreements. Just educating yourself. When we first got into cannabis, we found out about these city city meetings, these zoning meetings. We found out. We just went on the website. We emailing councilmen. We go up to City Hall. If it wasn't COVID, we probably would have went to City Hall today just to say, hey, guys, just, you know, checking in, you know. So that's what we encourage people to do is, you know, the education is out there, but you just have to find it because it's not going to be given to us because they don't want to give it to us. Yeah. Um, but it's out there and we're trying to educate the community on how we found out the information. So, you know, if they want to go into business, they'll be like, oh yeah, I know to go to this website or I know to go to this zoning meeting because we put the information out there now. Now that we're in the know, as soon as we find out about an event, a zoning meeting, a council meeting, we put it all out on social media. Like, hey y'all, they having this meeting, just to let you know, you should go. Yeah. Right. You guys, I'm so sorry to kind of interrupt, but I just wanted to make sure that we said goodbye to Al because he's got another call to jump on. And Al, on your way out, can you give us kind of three things that you think people should really hold about this conversation or just tips that you want to share with folks? 
Yeah, it's just, you know, um, you know, to touch on what the lady just said too, it's really about, you know, if this is something that you want to do, like you just got to put your all into it. You know, you can't quit. Uh, you know, I feel like, you know, that's the reason why I, I'm where I am today in the, in the business, because definitely, I definitely had a lot of peaks and valleys. And, um, you know, there was some real tough times where I really sat at home, like, you know what, maybe this isn't for me. But, you know, for me, I realize it's bigger than me. You know what I mean? This is for me and for my people, you know, and I'm trying to use my platform to elevate our people of color um, to be able to participate in an industry that I feel like is rightfully ours for real. You know, right now, I think we only represent three to four percent of the industry. And that's crazy because when you think about the way the war on drugs was pretty much they use cannabis to destroy our community, lock up our fathers, lock up our mothers, leave the kids, you know, to be, you know, raised by the system, which is pretty much locking them up as well. So you talk about the systematic oppression and different things like that, you know, the cannabis was one of the big tools that they used to put us in the position that we're in today. So now there's billions of dollars being made and, you know, they're trying to keep us out and that's just not right. You know what I mean? I just really feel like, you know, this is generational wealth at risk for our community. And we have to, you know, understand it and look at it that way, you know, and, you know, I think someone touched on like how we have to continue to even sell our people about the industry. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, listen, like this is, this is ours. This is something that we helped create. We pioneered this and it would be crazy if we become customers again. And I just feel like history always repeats itself. When you think about it, rice, sugar, cotton, uh, liquor, the lottery, you know, that was all us. Like we all, we was right there. I mean, you know, hell, take it even a step further. Like we built America, right? And we don't own any of it. So I just feel like this is our opportunity to take ownership. And, you know, we got to fight for this at all costs, you know? And if it's whether it's you going down to city hall, or, you know, going to all the national lobby days, we have to make sure these people hear our voices because if we don't, they will just continue to shoo shoo us and pacify this issue, pacify that issue. And then in a minute, you know, to the, you know, to the lady's point, you know, all in our communities, again, you know, it's going to be all these dispensaries and all these different things and, and people that are owning them don't look like us. We just can't have that. So, you know, that's my biggest thing is just continue to educate yourself, continue to look at this opportunity as what it is, an unbelievable opportunity. And, you know, like I said, when you think about that as generational wealth at risk, you know, you should take this very serious. Thanks so much, Al. We really appreciate it. Um, all right, thank you, guys. All righty. And Have ladies, I'm sorry, we'll pick right back up with Michael and the um, rest of our team. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say, I think Latoya, Latoya, you in the white shirt? Yeah, yeah. So I think, okay. yeah. One of the things that she said, <laughs> um, you talked about making, if you, you said, like, if you're a lawyer, how can you apply that? expertise to the cannabis industry. Um, and I think that's a big thing that I would encourage us to think about as well, because I know in Illinois right now, at some point we're gonna reach capacity. You're gonna reach saturation with respect to cultivation, you know, um, craft growth facilities, dispensaries, all of that, you know, and even if every one of those licenses went to people who look like the, us, it's not gonna be enough, you know? Um, so what else can you do? And I feel like I'm an example of that. Um, I'm not suggesting you go out and, you know, you go out and white, work for a white cannabis company, but I am saying that my background is in social justice and mental health. And, um, you know, that's what I went to school for. That's what I'm passionate about. So I'm applying that experience and passion to the cannabis industry. And so if you are a lawyer, what do you need to know about cannabis regulations to be able to market yourself to these cannabis companies, these dispensary owners or cultivation facility owners. Um, same thing with real estate. Real estate is huge in the cannabis industry. It's everything in the cannabis industry. So if you're involved in real estate, how do you get involved in it from a cannabis perspective? What do you need to know about, um, for example, if somebody, if your client is looking for a storefront, it can't be 1,500 feet from the last dispensary if you're in the city of Chicago. You need to know those type of things as a real estate broker. Same thing with any other um, ancillary business. Um, you know, we need janitors, we need security cameras, we need security people, <laughs> we need plumbers. You need everything to stand your business up and to maintain it. So what is it that you're currently doing now that you can apply to the cannabis industry. And that's one of the things that we're also doing 
as part of our incubator is holding a separate cohort for minority business owners to understand like, okay, if you, if you don't want to get involved in the cannabis industry from the perspective of dispensary or cultivation or infusion, let's take your business and then make it marketable to those people who do want to be involved that way. But there's a huge opportunities there as well. And Michael, I think those are uh, definitely some excellent points because at the end of the day, as you pointed out, everybody can't be a dispensary owner or a cultivator or a processor. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, goals and initiatives that we have, you know, with this particular program is to kind of expose people to other opportunities. And, uh, you know, as you pointed out, like yourself, you know, working, you know, in the co on the corporate side of uh, the cannabis space. And, you know, for you, um, you know, you're doing it in a social justice capacity, but, you know, you do need people in finance, you do need people in accounting and different things like that. Um, so, you know, from your vantage point of perspective, for those interested on the corporate side, what are your recommendations for somebody that wants to transition from, I guess, what we would classify as a traditional industry approach, if you're an accountant or a finance or an attorney uh, person, how do you, how do, if you wanted to apply to a Cresco or different things like that, how do you make your application stand out uh, if you don't have any uh, cannabis experience? Well, um, I can tell you what I did <laughs> because I, you know, I, again, I'm, you know, I, they had to sit me down and talk. I'm not a cannabis consumer or anything. So they had to sit me down and, and educate me a lot about the cannabis industry. Um, but the way I got myself involved is you know, I, I was in looking for employment um, and I wanted to get back into social justice work. I saw the position available at Cresco. I really felt like it, you know, I, I felt like the job was written for me. Um, and so I applied, you know, just regularly through the Cresco website. But then I went on LinkedIn and I looked to see who was the director of recruitment at Cresco. And I sent her a message and this is me, this is who I am, this is why I feel like I'm a good candidate for this role. And we were on the phone the next day. You know, I had my phone screen the very next day. Um, so I think the, the overall thing is, is just like as a, as a prospective dispensary owner, you sell yourself, you get yourself involved. Someone in the chat said a closed mouth does not get fed. Absolutely right, <laughs> you know. Um, lots of people want to work in the cannabis industry. They want to work at Cresco. So they get thousands of applications. So what are you going to do to make yourself stand out? And for me, that was find out the person who's making those initial selections, um, you know, who's getting the phone interviews and things like that on LinkedIn. I think part of it, I, I don't know. I don't know what possessed me to do that. I just got caught on the right day. But um, also, you can contact me, you know, I'll tell you if Cres Cresco's on the hiring freeze right now, because you're not in retail or uh, cultivation, but um, I would say Cresco corporate is on the hiring freeze right now. But people ask me all the time, you know, can you send my resume? People hit me up all the time on LinkedIn. Um, and people have gotten hired that way. Um, when we're out at panels, you know, you have people um, Collectium is a cannabis business. Reach out to them. Do you need some help? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so again, just advocate for yourself. Speak up. Reach out to the people who own the businesses, who are doing the hiring, and sell yourself to them. Uh, that's good to know. Um, so my question for uh, Rebecca and Latoya, seeing as how you know, um, you know, you all have been in the game, you know, getting your hands dirty for a few years. Um, and it's a similar question, you know, at the end of the day, everybody can't be a cultivator or a processor or a dispensary owner. And, uh, you know, each state's laws are different. Uh, you know, I know Illinois and California allow for social consumption in public outside of the house, whereas a lot of other uh, states require for, for, require for consumption to be uh, limited to just a uh, house or private, private uh, property. What are some... Um, other areas in the cannabis space that you all would recommend, you know, for people that are, you know, interested in, in getting in the game, but, you know, they don't know how to cultivate, they don't know how to process, and they don't have the uh, the interest in owning this dispensary. You know, I've seen some things like puff and paint, uh, you know, catered meals and different things like that. So, uh, you know, as individuals that are, you know, out there in the community, uh, you know, really uh, making things happen, what are some of uh, the things that you all are seeing or recommendations that you would have for people uh, you know, just other business opportunities in the cannabis space that don't require you to, you know, need access to millions of dollars to, that, to still be able to participate. Yeah, so it's really just about, again, what Rebecca said, using your skill set. So I think whatever it is that you're good at, whatever it is that you feel like is a passion for you, cannabis can be a part of that that story, you know. 
Yeah, I would just look at the full supply chain um, of cannabis, you know, if it's not plant touching, because getting a plant touching business is very challenging. What are some auxiliary services? What I don't see a lot of are, you know, I see a lot of like people who want to throw cannabis events, but I don't see a lot of like consultants for their specific areas. So for instance, if you have background in finance and financial modeling or accountant, you know, accounting. I don't really see a lot of people of color doing that, you know, um, marketing, uh, cannabis, especially as all these brands pop up is going to become more competitive to get your brand out there. So if you're a marketer, if you're an IG influencer, you know, uh, how can you transfer those skills to this industry? Um, or just doing things that are cool. You know, we need more apparel companies, you know, more, I don't know, like makeup companies. I just would look at the entire supply chain and say, okay, some people consume cannabis in different ways. You know, you got those smokers. So you could think about a business that's for them. And then you got people who consume cannabis just with edibles and topicals or no THC at all. So just thinking about opportunities for those consumers, because I believe that the market is gonna shift from you know, all these kind of flower brands to a lot of uh, vapes, you know, so that soccer moms and all that kind of stuff, it can be more concealed, you can travel with it. So just think about those, those those uh, demographics, because I think the cannabis industry now is a full, full of a lot of like green 420, stoner this, loud that. So just think about the other consumer, you know, think about the fancy consumer or the new consumer, just, you know, putting out products for them or services. Even with us now being operators, I would love to consult with nothing but people of color, you know, for the designer to grow, the facility, our architect. And, you know, we try to find people of color out there, but we can't find, you know, uh, an energy specialist that looks like us. We can't find an engineer that looks like us. And I know they out there. I went to school, I went to some of the best schools, so I know they out there, but they're not in cannabis. So, we need those type of people, you know, to complete the full, you know, um, supply chain. I think a lot of people of color who, you know, we grew up with cannabis is bad. You're going to go to jail. I think a lot of people are just hesitant about being in the cannabis industry because of how cannabis has been taught to us in our community. But take, take the plant touching out of it and just think about this is the fastest growing industry in America in regards to jobs. Since COVID, sales are up. We've been mad busy since COVID. What other industry can you see that in? You know, especially if you don't have a job right now, start looking at cannabis. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm an electrician. How can I work in cannabis? What? We need electricians all the time. I'm a plumber. How can I work in cannabis? What? We're looking for a plumber right now. So that's what I would say. Okay, I get a little passionate. Thanks, Keith, for. <laughs> I, I'm so in agree. I'm in so in agree in agreement with with you all that I think that's huge. I mean, there are whole departments. I sit, you know, in a whole department of lawyers. You know, there's a whole department of just social media people at Cresco. Okay. Not marketing as in as a whole, just social media. There's a whole infrastructure around social media. Then you got communications. Then you get there's a real estate department. So. All of those departments at Cresco, most people didn't come with Cresco, I mean, with cannabis uh, expertise. They don't, they're learning just like me, you know? Um, so all of those departments could be us in those jobs. And then the other thing that I was gonna say um, is that some of the conversations that we're having right now is how do we re increase our minority um, vendors? You know, we, we have to buy packaging and all types of things. So how do we increase those contracts to black and brown people? And some of the feedback we've been getting is exactly that. In some of the, in some of the industries that we're looking to have these big contracts, 
there are no black and brown business owners you know in that in that space or they're not coming forth in that space so you know look at the alcohol industry what is what is the alcohol industry done how has it evolved over time what you know what are some of the ways that it's gotten really sophisticated and how do you, how could you fit in there and that's how you could fit in in the cannabis industry as well yeah well that's um just me my personal story is kind of everything that you just described i just created a hodgepodge of all the things that I um, have done. I started upcycling. Um, I did major in biology in college, so I knew how to decarboxylize. My math skills were up, so I said, let me figure out how to microdose, because I noticed here that that was a divide. There was a divide between you know, folks in the space, like if you didn't understand how to microdose, because you have to know how many milligrams to put per serving so that in this bar, you know, you're within these limits. And I'd say, you know, it's great. It's the best thing for me about this cannabis space is it's just been a combination of everything I've already have been doing. And I said this on my last show, I'm a super cannabis consumer. So I'm that soccer mom at Disneyland. Like I got to go outside of Disneyland and get a break because they're killing me. And that's where vape pen could come in, you know, like, so it's like, I'm all of those people that you described. And I think a lot of folks on here are also all of those people. I know when Michael and I first started talking, she's, she's like, Charles, I've never even smoked. So she's like, Can't, I had, you know, no experience in cannabis, yet she's someone that we're saying we need in these positions that are going to listen, that will understand the real, you know, but understand also from her perspective, um, as a part of a corporation, you know, how to go between both worlds. And so um, I think that taking whatever skill it is that you have can definitely be applied um, in the cannabis space. And we're not always looking for cultivators. Um, with me getting my micro license, I don't cultivate. My business partner cultivates. If you look in my backyard this year with my plants I have this year, you would think I was a cultivator because they're doing really well. But it's like, you know, we just kind of combine all of our skills. Education was something that he did social justice, um, working in the community, policy, those were things that I've been able to do um, as a volunteer and also professionally. So I would say that that's a great tip, you know, for people to just look at what you have, because what you have is enough and just take what you have and go for it, you know. Don't quit, keep going and, you know, continuing to be a part of this um, group because I feel like with every show, we've created a new connection We've created access. Now you're saying you need a black electrician. Now I'm, I'm going to call you and give you that. You know, Michael has needs that she's looking for folks that they can incubate, you know, let's get them to them, you know. And so it's just about yeah. filling in all of those nooks and crannies and getting things done and everyone kind of sharing and listening. And that's our goal today. I feel like we're accomplishing that. Um, and I'm very appreciative of all of you for your great stories for the work that you're doing, um, for contributing to um, this horrible experience we all had growing up being impacted by the war on drugs, you know? And I, when we were talking about like, how do we have these conversations? All of us have this grandma that we need grandma coming with us to be our PR person. Grandma needs to be the marketer. You know, those are the people that can come in and break those stigmas. Um, when we work in the South specifically, I said earlier, we can't mention social equity so it's like, how do we break that barrier in this Bible Belt? Well, we start talking about expungement. You know, hey, let's get that loved one out. Let's rebuild this Black family. Let's talk about financial stability. So there's different methods um, that we have to employ that are specific to those environments that we're trying to create change in. And so um, just, you know, I learned a lot today about what's going on in Detroit. Like when you're telling me there's these recreational and there's a medicinal, I'm like, what? You know, like in Georgia, there's gonna be six licenses. Six license, no vertical license. What I've learned here is if you have a vertical license, you increase your success because you're not waiting for other people to fulfill those components, to distribute, to transfer, to deliver your product. So it's like, you know, we see all of these barriers that have been placed up. And so I'm happy to be on here with folks that have, have hopped over those barriers or kicked them down, you know, or use their privilege. My best friend is the head of the marijuana task force for for Oakland and he's a consumer and you can be, you know, cause it's recreational here, but he's always been a great source for me. Like understanding the policy aspect, figuring out ways that I can dive into different things and not have too much current, you know, in those 
swimming, you know, swimming through those different trials and tribulations. So I just want to, um, again, I'm always saying it, thank you, because I'm very appreciative. Kevin has hopped on. Um, Kevin works with um, Uplift Maryland. He's the CEO, and he's helped us out a lot in the background. He is um, HBCU certified, Morehouse. <laughs> and, um, Kevin. We missed you for some of the call. We were just talking about uh, social equity, talking about some of those barriers, talking about how we all have overcome some of those obstacles and whatever tools it is that we've employed in um, kind of knickknacking through this uh, industry. So if you could just briefly just give us a little intro about what you're doing, um, the work that you've done and what you feel would be a great, uh, a great, uh, a great universal system for social equity. If you could create a universal social equity system, what would it look like? So I guess uh, starting off, my name is Kevin Ford. I started Uplift Maryland at the end of 2018, more so to do like uh, uh, patient certifications. But then uh, after a while, coupled with my experience from the Prince George's County government uh, doing supplier diversity and development and procurement, I was able to apply for a grant to uh, develop and implement an education and business development training program for minorities and women who were interested in applying for grower and processor licenses last year in Maryland. Um, since then, we've also been able to win a second contract from the commission here to do a dispensary agent training program. And we've also spent a lot of time lobbying uh, in Annapolis to try to get, uh, you know, more opportunity for folks who look like us uh, in the industry. Um, so our solution that we actually put forth last year, unfortunately, it didn't go anywhere as of yet, is to look at this in a different lens and not necessarily as social equity, but more so as just opportunity in general. And, and with those opportunity, with the opportunities, coupling that with the resources to ensure that people are not only able to enter the market, but also um, succeed in the market. Um, so we've been fighting here in Maryland essentially just to open it up to get rid of these uh, license caps to allow anybody who is interested to be able to go and apply for a license and get one and have a fair shot at getting their uh, business open. Uh, we've seen from other states that move to this type of model that there is a lot more uh, local control. And I think that honestly, people will probably rather deal with uh, their local government than the state government uh, in terms of uh, these licensing processes. Um, so that's been our, our take is really just trying to uh, get Maryland to move to an open model um, that would allow uh, anybody to have an opportunity to get at least that initial license just to have the opportunity to start a business. And we know that um, although opportunity is great, it doesn't, um, it doesn't guarantee success. And, and that's why I mentioned uh, it's, it's important to couple the opportunity with the resources um, that are necessary for, for these businesses, like I said, to not only enter the market, but to succeed. Thank you. I love that. Um, sorry, I keep touching my eye. It wouldn't open up this morning. So it's just been bothering me and kind of throbbing all day. So if you see me touching it, um, not crazy, just my eye hurts. So I think we're going to go over to Tiffany right now and she's going to get into a couple of Q and A questions. Um, after that, we're going to give our weekly business tips and we will have be followed up with a Cresco moment after that. So thank you, Tiffany. Okay, so we had a few questions that popped into the chat. And just so you know, everybody, this goes to any of the panelists, if you care to answer. Um, and I'm going to try to frame a couple of them. So we had someone say, are these cannabis corporations genuinely interest, interested in funding equity programs for minorities? What do we think? Well, I can speak for Cresco. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, let me. I'm sorry, my video is not on. Okay, so I can I can speak for Cresco, uh, but that's all I can speak for. Um, and I would say yes, um, we are genuinely interested. Um, I am genuinely interested. You know, some of the conversations that I have with my leadership is that you know this is not just my job. This is personal. You know, <laughs> um, I'm I, I'm a black woman and want to see us succeed 
um, as much as anybody else. Um, you know, at Cresco, just by the, the, my existence at Cresco, um, to me is saying that they're making that investment because they're not just, you know, in the market to, okay, well, we have to check the box on social equity. They hire me. I have a team of people that um, work at Cresco. So they're making an investment just in our salaries and overhead to focus on nothing but social equity programming. Um, and then also last year we spent about $1.5 million, you know, on our social equity um, programs. And that was just the first year of our social equity program where we just started year two um, and we're looking to do even more this year. So again, speaking for Cresco, yes, you know, I, and I feel like I feel obligated, you know, I work for a big white, you know, cannabis company. I need to look these people in their eyes and see, is this just lip service and you just hire me to check a box or is this something that you really want to do? And yeah. I, be I believe that, you know, my leadership, it, they are really invested on a personal and professional level. I'm gonna do an add on for that because I think that that's a critical piece to understand though. It's not just that Cresco hired someone, it's that Cresco hired someone like you, right? Because I think that that makes a difference when you have someone that has an, a, a really clearly defined commitment to the kind of work that you did before you got there so that when they made that as a choice, it kind of spoke to what you were gonna help hold them accountable to doing. I'm not saying, and that hasn't been our experience that other organizations have done that same kind of hiring, right? But, um, it, and it's one of the reasons why Kinshasa was really clear that when the two of you met, she was like, okay, I'm good with her. So that by extension, <laughs> we'll probably be, be good with them, right? And I think right. that was a real space, right? Um, yeah. I mean, we've had some, some tough conversations, you know, since George Floyd was murdered and you know, there's tough conversations going around. Like, do you even know why seed exists? Not to my leadership, but to all my colleagues. It's like, well, let's talk about this. And, and like you said, I'm holding you accountable too. You know, I work here. I want Cresco to be successful as anybody else because that's how I eat. But I need to be able to, you know, speak to my conscience. You know, what, what are we doing? You know, and how can we hold myself accountable and hold my leadership accountable as well? So anybody else want to chime in or we're going to go to the next question? Go to the next one? Okay. So someone asked, there were a couple of things around um, federal discrimination laws. And they were like, do they really apply to the cannabis industry because it's not federally legal? And I want you all to think, and part of the thing to think about with that discussion is there were some comments that were happening in the thread before that were all around, like, um, if you're in a state where things are legalized, then there are, and, and not regulated, because I think that's a really big thing that we noticed here in California, is that there were things and laws put on the books, like Oakland is a really good example, that had a social equity program that was built into the, the structure, but how it was implemented, versus how it was intended has been extremely different, right? And then when you look at, um, like Kinshasa said, what Cannabis Analytics has been able to do here in the Bay is we tried to work with a lot of incubation programs because we were clear, we were going for a full social justice hub model where we wanted to create one kind of major space where people could build their licenses and their brands within kind of a construct of a group dynamic. And it was... Um, I'm gonna call it painful so that I don't cuss, about how people took advantage of folks in these spaces. And the fact that we literally had to say to people, we can't work with you because our integrity won't let us do that. And then had to tell other folks, you can't, you can't work with them because they don't mean you any good, right? But the truth is there's no federal regulation to support people once they've invested. Like there's a lot of, places where once you um once you apply for a license even if you don't get it you don't get that money back and we're talking five six figure amounts of money that people had to scrape up to put that together right and i mean between groups and folks so i think it's an interesting thing for us to understand that as long as things aren't federally held that you will run the risk of federal issues depending on who you are and if you really don't have the kind of money to have the kind of attorneys and supports to get you through that it can really be a challenge. 
I think Al said that too earlier. Yeah. My things about like this this predatory issue in the in the uh, industry is that that speaks back to education too. You know, um, some people feel like you know you can't sell your license if you get a license and you want to turn around and sell it. You know, to a company you shouldn't be allowed to do that. I think it's really up to the individual, and I think if you want to, you know, trade your social equity status for, you know, for income for yourself, I think that's, you know, that's that's something you can do. But the thing is, what's hap what's happening in Chicago is people are like, well, I'll give you twenty five thousand dollars if I can put your name on this application. No, if you don't put my name on the application, I'm gonna need a couple million dollars. You know, I I, I know what this is worth. <laughs> you know, so yeah, you can use my name, but this is how much it's gonna cost you. So educate yourself on that. If you know, don't get something for nothing. You know, and that's one thing that I actually ran into a lot uh, during my grant program. I had people calling me from all over the country, like, "Hey, we know you have access to all the black people who are interested in this. <laughs> link, link me up with somebody." You know, and for me, it was like, "Listen, that's not that's not how we're rocking over here." You know, we we right. that's not what we want here in Maryland. And that's half the reason why you know these licenses still haven't been issued yet. Um, so if if you're approached by one of these large companies and and they want to give you a dollar amount, like like Michael said, don't take that twenty five, even fifty thousand when what you what that thing is really worth is you know, you're getting pennies on the dollar. It might seem like a nice check up front, but you know, you're getting bamboozled. So, you know, you want to make sure that you you have some attorneys on your side too, who number one, yeah. understand the issue of straw man ownership and make yeah. sure that your paperwork is is tight from the get go. And that's like Michael said, also, they're literally preying on people who have a lower education level, you yeah. know? And I mean, you, you, you have to give it up. I wish to somebody for, would approach me because I got a number. <laughs> me too. I got a, I got a number too. But that's that's the reason that's the reason that they won't approach us though is because they know that we understand. You know? And it's also that that lower education level. But I think one of the things that we've seen it's also about like access and resources, right? If you don't have a group, a team of folks like Conservation Analytics, Kinshasa is the leader of this organization, but all of us play a role based on the expertise that we have in different parts of the of the industry right and not just in cannabis so a lot of us transferred like we've been telling people all day we transferred a lot of our skills into this industry and especially because we came together on the same the premise that our communities were preyed on for decades and devastated by what happened and now you can look in those same neighborhoods and see a dispensary that's run by folks that look nothing like us. Exactly. And we were like, that's, that's the, basically that shit is unacceptable. Yep. And so now what can we do and how do we collectively kind of move together? And that's gonna lead me to this question, Chasta, and I'm gonna let you say something. Um, is there an association for black indigenous people of color to provide their services to this market? Does that type of group need to be created? Um, or could an environment like this start it? Well, that is the goal of part of these conversations. If you all look, we did, we're doing a series of eight of these conversations all on different topics throughout the industry. And our main purpose was to create opportunity and access points for people to get points that could go to in with some of our larger partners if they wanted to apply for positions, saying that they completed the show, the level of investment that they had in wanting to learn about this. So that's why we did this first and foremost. But like Kinshasa said earlier, we originally started this as in-person conversations, mainly through HBCUs in the South, but really to elevate the conversation around what cannabis is and what it is not. Because the stigma around it, especially down South, especially with Black folk, and especially Black folk over the age of 60, is a real barrier. And those are the voters. If you really look at who votes, that's who that is. So we were clear that we needed to approach this conversation and build capacity of other folks to have this discussion because we cannot change it if we can't get these to be laws that are shifted, right? So back to the question. Sorry, that was a soapbox moment. Um, <laughs> do we think that we need to create some level of networking space or opportunity to continue these discussions? Yeah, and I think that 
well, not even think, I know that, you know, my peers across the country are definitely gearing a few things up. Um, Rico uh, Lamy or Rico Tarver out of LA, uh, he was formerly with Canon Gather. He's creating something new. Um, there's folks in New York that, you know, have, it's a, it's quite a few companies out of New York, actually, including Can Inclusive and um, a lot of these folks who are trying to bring a, a communal aspect to it. And I think that that's one thing that we're also trying to do with Uplift as well. Uh, so I do believe it, it's needed for sure. And I think organically, we're um, connecting this. Um, a lot of folks, I met Kevin, Kevin connected me to Mary, to Tangi. You know, I'm at Barrington. Barrington connected me to Michael. I get random calls um, from different cannabis companies, especially because of George Floyd. And again, not not Cresco, but I got calls, you know, from other folks that were interested, you know, because of the environment that we're going on, that's going on. And I think the best thing that we can do, and everyone's information is all on our website, which is www.hbcuci. I have links to everyone's um, show or not show, excuse me, to their websites so that anyone that's engaging with us can access you all because it's not just about us. We're all trying to connect with you, trying to connect with everyone. And it's, it's just been so, it's been cool. Like uh, on our HBCU on the Horizon show, there's going to be a professor, Chris Duvall. He's a Caucasian man that's been studying cannabis in Africa. So when I, you know, throughout this process, he's the person that we've connected to. He's wrote a whole book about how they were trading us as slaves with cannabis, you know? And so I never knew that. And so I just think that organically we're going to create that and we have created that we're doing it. And I just hope to continue to meet great folks like you guys and to continue to have these conversations and keep things going. I muted myself, mute. sorry. Sorry. Um, okay, so we're at 1136. So I just wanted to make sure that we note the time. And we're going to um, push to the so just so that everyone understands. Um, one of the framings for this, we had some questions initially around, um, could this be for any person of color, right, not just students from HBCUs. And I said yes, because one of the things that we wanted people to understand is, as sure as there is a school to prison pipeline, there can be other pipelines. Right, so our kind of core tenant around this work was creating a pipeline from HBCUs into this industry because we knew that there was a wealth of talent in those spaces, but that does not mean that we don't understand that there's other talent from other people of color in other spaces. So we are holding that room, but be clear, our initiative is focused on creating a, a clear through line for HBCU participants, graduates, uh, alumnus to come into this industry and to um, have access points into it, right? So we want to make sure that everyone understands nobody is excluded, but we did want to make sure that we called out um, because a lot of times when it's um, initiatives and work for people of color and Black folks specifically, people are afraid to say that. So we're clear that that's what we're saying with this work. Um, so we have, we're going to pass it over just to our, and what we do every week is a kind of student support piece where we talk about resume building and all kinds of conversations like that. So Chas, I'm gonna pass it to you so you can pass it over. Okay, yes, we're gonna have S. Mitchell Career Development and Services. Um, they're two wonderful, very cute um, young women, very smart, and um, every week they've been helping us give tips they started um, working with family members and um, helping them to get prepared for interviews and stuff. And so now they've transitioned their skills in the same way that we've described. And let me take it over to Chantel and Salita. They're gonna give you a couple of quick tips. Hello everyone. Unfortunately, Salita wasn't able to join us today, but um, I'm Chantel. Here, hang on, let me share my screen. Oh. You're still able to share it. Oh, here we go. 
Okay, so um, a little bit about our company. Um, Chas already kind of said that we specialize in career coaching and consultation, building resume and cover letters, and identifying future employers. And a little bit about who we are. Again, my sister wasn't able to join us today, but um, I graduated from Cal State LA with a business degree um, with a concentration in human resources management. I have over eight years experience in that field. And right now I'm currently an HR coordinator for UC Berkeley. Um, so we have identified seven different stages when it comes to developing your career. And today we're gonna go over um, network support, which is kind of like the running theme for today. So um, just a, a quick recap from last week, we wanted you guys to um, just think about how you're perceived over social media, um, what is a good elevator pitch, and how will you market yourself? And then if you got a chance, if you were able to Google yourself and just to see what came up. So with networking 101, um, you know, this saying is uh, pretty common. It's not always what you know, but it's who you know. So with networking, it is good to get out of your comfort zone, to try to attend different little um, like online communities, webinars, one such as this one, um, join professional associations, uh, alumni events, just different ways to get yourself out there to meet different people, maybe find mentors, find information. Um, you always wanna prepare an elevator speech that can range between 30 seconds and 60 seconds. You never know who you're gonna meet. You might just have that one shot. So you wanna just you know, give a quick introduction. Um, what are your goals? What are your experiences? And what can you offer? Um, next, it's always good to maintain connections with your current employer and past employers. You may need like someone to be a reference for you. You may need recommendation letters. And then business cards, even though they're kind of old school, it's always good to have them handy. People, you know, like might type in your information wrong on their phone, or if you just say it to them, they might forget what you say. So business cards are always a good tool. And then um, social media, that's always, you know, something that's in your control. And one of the really beneficial social media platforms I would also like to go over today is LinkedIn. Um, for those of you who already have a LinkedIn, here's a quick snapshot of mine, so feel free to go ahead and follow me. But for those of you who have never heard of LinkedIn or never used it, I just wanted to go over some of the benefits. Um, LinkedIn can help uh, build a professional network. Um, you can also demonstrate your expertise and experiences through your LinkedIn profile. Um, colleagues, they can endorse your skills. They can leave recommendations on your profile that's public. Um, this is a good tool to see what companies are hiring, what type of positions are out there. And then it also attracts professional opportunities. Recruiters do actively look through LinkedIn for positions that they're trying to fill. So this is a great um, platform to promote yourself professionally. Um, just a quick snap snapshot. Um, this just explains what I do. Um, just a quick like in writing elevator pitch for the about me. If you continue to scroll through the profile, that's where you can see all the experience and the endorsements and recommendations. Um, next, I wanted to go over social media etiquette. Um, it's good to always utilize your privacy settings, especially for the pages that you that really are just meant for like friends and family. Um, we suggest always just trying to post things that you wouldn't mind um, coworkers or future employers, uh, supervisors seeing. Um, for networking purposes, it's always good to have a separate um, professional public um, plat uh, page. Um, and then to know your digital footprint, that's why I've suggested Googling yourself, just seeing what's out there. Sometimes we're tagged in things by friends that aren't that flattering, <laughs> but it's always good to just see what's out there. There might be some old profiles like MySpace or things that you no longer use that no longer reflect who you are as a person or professionally. So it's good to try to get those things taken down or deactivate them. So that's good social media etiquette. Um, so yeah, so that's the trips and tips for, tips for um, networking. Next week, we're going to go over cover letter and resume building. So have your resume handy, um, if possible, and we're going to be sharing our trips and our tips and tricks with that. Oh, thank um, you. Thank you, so Thank you so much. Oh, we also today are having a, con a raffle. If you
subscribe on our website or follow at least one of our um, social medias, then we will pick two people to do a free social media audit. So feel free to enter in with the raffle and thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you, Chantel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Salita. I know she she just started her thing today. She's an yeah. administrator. So um, we miss her, but thank you so much. No problem. So next, we're going to move to our Cresco Lab Spotlight, and we'll go back to Michael. And after that, Tiffany will give us a recap of the day, and we'll give you information about next week's, excuse me, next week's um, show, which is Cannabis Policy and Advocacy. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you all have heard a lot about the SEED program um, at Cresco Lab so far. The, to re rehash that, um, but going back to the question about, you know, are big cannabis companies really interested? Cresco absolutely is. Um, I will say that what we're doing in the seed program is a lot of, it, a lot of it is about giving the information to us um, and at, at no cost or no financial obligation to you. Like some of the, some of the questions are, you know, in order to be in our incubator, don't we need to have a certain percentage in, uh, in your company? No, um, not, that's not our model. Um, certainly, it'd be great, you know, if we helped you open a dispensary and Cresco, you know, some of the Cresco brands are, are on your shelf. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's real, you know, but the, the seed program is really about um, providing those wraparound services by way of expungement. We're even exploring clemency um, at this point um, through our community business incubator, which we've so far, we've helped about 50 businesses, uh, 50 black and brown businesses apply for their either dispensary or cultivation or infuser license here in Illinois. Um, and we're looking to expand that outside of Illinois. COVID has made that a bit challenging, but we're still figure, trying to figure out ways to do this on a virtual level. Um, and then also through our education and workforce development. And the big piece that I didn't say earlier about education workforce development is a lot of our work is, is uh, supporting programs like this and also putting our expertise, so our lawyers, our marketing people, our social media teams, our retail people, our cultivation folks out there in the community so that you can learn from them. Um, one of our biggest partners within Cresco is our horticulture um, experts. You know, they work with our incubator participants to tell them about a cultivation facility and to walk them through our facilities and help them understand what it is that they need to know about how are you going to put, how are you going to grow cannabis in Illinois? You know, <laughs> like this is in California, you know, how, how are you going to do this and be successful? And you're not going to put a plan in your living room. So what is it that you need to do? Um, so a lot of it is that it's about that setting expectations level setting you know um helping to dispel myths some of that was talked about and you know our our the, our group of people our older population that's voting some of them don't understand how how cannabis is really a component of health and wellness so helping folks to understand that and helping folks to understand what is going to be required of you if you want to get into this business 
And what are the tools that you need? What access to information do you need? So that's what we're about is really getting out there, forming those relationships, building rapport, um, because we know we're side-eyed, you know, from the beginning, you know, just by nature of who we are. So you have to build that relationship and, and really, you know, we build our reputation by what it is that we're doing. That's what I say about Let's Go and the Seed Initiative. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Tiffany's going to close us out. Um, I just want to say um, thank you to all of our guests today on the show. We're going to have links up. We have links up now for the exams for session one and the video. Session two will be up in the next hour or two, and you'll have all four sessions by Friday. So some of you all want to need to catch up. We apologize for our delay in getting the exams out, but they'll all be out, including today's session questions um, by this Friday. So um, again, thank you guys. Uh, Tiffany, any last words? Yeah, just um, so one of the things we want people to hold from today's session is everyone on here believes that social equity is, um, is a necessary part of how the cannabis industry moves forward and how that looks in different places has been really different. And for those of you that are interested, we always say you can think globally, but you have to start locally. You have to start seeing what's the work that's happening in your local communities. So that means what ballot initiatives have been pushed forward, which elected officials actually support this work. How do you see if there is work happening in your community? How do you, how do you get attached to that work first? Now, what we care about is we are trying to elevate this to a national conversation because we believe that once this becomes federally um, approved, the opportunities I personally believe are going to shrink at some point because there are big, big groups. There's big pharma, there's big tobacco, there's alcohol. They are looking and waiting to, to create that kind of investment and they don't have to um, they don't have to go find funding, right? They, they have it and they're ready. So a lot of the work that we're trying to get people to do now is start looking at it, understanding what this industry really is and what it's all about. And just kind of reflecting on some of the conversations we had today. Like even the people that are talking about incubators, you need to be prepared to be incubated, right? So this isn't just you going and, oh, I have an idea or... And, you know, and I actually had somebody tell me this, like, I roll the best blunt on the planet. I really need to be working in a place. And I was like, really? That's, that's going to be your calling card? Um, there's lots of people that roll a good blunt, right? So what we're we saying is that- We have machines that do that. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, but what we're trying to get people to see is that take this industry seriously because it is a business, especially if you plan on trying to make your livelihood at it. There were questions that we got that we weren't able to get to. We are pulling together an FAQ from all of the sessions and we're gonna have that. It'll be up on the site next week. Um, but like you heard Kinshasa say, you could go back to the website. All of the videos will be up by Friday, including the, there's a quiz that goes with each one. You have to complete six of the eight quizzes to get the certification saying that you completed the series. And, and if you have any questions, our hbcucei.com, that's the site. You can um, ask questions there. We have an information email address as well. Um, we want to thank, we've had over a couple of hundred people join us for these conversations over the last few weeks once we totaled up all of the attendees. So we want to say thank you for that because we are trying to create a network of opportunities and information for you all and specifically saying that we are trying to create space for Black indigenous and people of color to be in this industry and to put our best foot forward in that work. So that's all for me. Thank you everybody and to all of our panelists sincerely. You make this work of it. Thank you.
open. Thanks again, everybody.